Back in 1997, um, Scott McNeely stood up on a stage and said, privacy is dead, get over it. Now, what he meant wasn't actually anything about privacy, um, although that wasn't obvious at the time. What he actually meant is that free will is dead and I'm gonna make a lot of money off all of you suckers now. Um, but that's a slightly harder message to, uh, to get people to, uh, to go along with. So the history of the internet in the past, especially 20 or so years, has been a really interesting shift from a set of systems which were explicitly designed when they were first built to encourage a certain kind of decentralization of power to allow people to speak freely and communicate freely across the scope of the globe. I had a really interesting opportunity last fall to spend some time with some of the early designers of the internet protocol, some of the people who wrote the kind of single digit request for comments that designed some of the, the very first kind of protocol definitions. And this was just after the Snowden leaks had broke and they were furious. They were furious because they had designed a politics into this network that they built and that politics had actually really pretty much bred true over, you know, 40 something years. And, you know, there, there were ways in which it had been subverted by layers that had been piled on top of it. And then they found out that the whole thing had been, had been undermined out from under them by the government that, that they thought they were collaborating with. Um, we call this, this process, especially of what's happened in the past 20 or so years, kind of the enclosure of the internet. Um, you know, in an analogy to the enclosure of the commons in England. And, it's the process by which systems that used to be decentralized have been made more and more centralized, have been restructured to track more and more data. And a lot of this tracking is corporate tracking. It's not just government tracking. We're dealing with both. But the specific set of trade-offs that, that McNeely was talking about when he was talking about the death of privacy are the trade-offs that have resulted in, for instance, Target being able to do what they've done in the U.S. around marketing. Um, Target decided, so in, in the U.S., and I assume it's similar in a lot of other markets, um, there were only a couple of places where there are actually big shifts in consumer buying habits. And it turns out that having your first kid is one of the biggest shifts in consumer buying habits. Um, the other ones are leaving home when you go away to college and getting divorced or moving in with a new partner. But um, because pregnancy is one of the biggest ones, there's this huge incentive for Target to be able to track and figure out when women are pregnant as early as possible. So they figured out, hey, there's a bunch of things that, uh, of product categories that women, if they suddenly start buying these, it probably indicates that they're pregnant. So they started tracking on the basis of those and then marketing baby goods to people who had suddenly started buying these things, you know, to try and get them to switch to shopping more at Target for groceries and whatever. Um, now, uh, in, a, in a specific case, this caused, uh, there was a gentleman who, was, who walked into a, a Target store extremely disturbed, saying that, well, you know, you've just started advertising, um, you know, maternity goods to my, to my 17 year old daughter. This is completely unacceptable. You need to stop doing this. And of course, the, the store manager had no idea what was going on. You know, he, he doesn't know anything about the, their big data marketing programs. Um, and then the next week he showed up at the store again and apologized and said, well, apparently there's something going on in my house I didn't know about. Um, and eventually Target realized that they got a lot of really nasty feedback because people were like, man, you know that I was pregnant before I told anyone. Like before I told my closest friends, that's really creepy. And so now they just sort of randomly happen to send you things that look like they're just a general bunch of stuff, but they have all of the same maternity goods shoved in there so that you don't notice what they're doing to you. And that bit where you don't notice how you're being manipulated, not on a society-wide level, you know, as it has been with advertising for a good while, but specifically you as an individual are being manipulated by an incredibly large structure of data that's being refined so that they can understand how that's going to shift your behavior. That's new. And that's what Scott McNeely was actually talking about when he said that privacy was dead. 
He was talking about individualized manipulation of specific people for ends that may be market ends, they may be any number of ends. So another really interesting uh, example of this, and again an American example, was what happened during the 2012 Obama election campaign. So normally they will go around and try to figure out, you know, who's a likely swing voter, you know, and sort of what general things might change people's minds, and then advertise or what have you on the basis of those general things. This time they had a lot more data. They had a massive amount of data. And what they did with that data is they figured out the political positions that were most likely to sway individual single voters. You know, which argument is going to make Johnny over here change his mind and vote a different way? Okay, now who needs to tell him that argument? You know, if he needs to hear an argument about women's rights, then he needs to hear it from one of these three kinds of people. Okay, now let's look through our volunteers database and see who we have on our volunteer database who knows Johnny and who, and then we give them a call and say, hey, can you go talk to so and so and tell them this story? And they did that across the entire electorate. It was pretty effective. But is that free will anymore when you are being, when your vote is being individually manipulated on that kind of scale on the basis of the full weight of everything you've posted to Facebook and all the marketing data that's extracted from that, your entire consumer buying profile from the credit card companies, everything that you've bought, the timing of things that you've bought, every statement that you've made, direct polling data supplementing this. Direct polling data not used in a statistical way to understand the intents of an electorate, but saying, well, we want to understand what this guy thinks specifically. So we're going to call this guy and ask him what he thinks and sure pretend it's part of a randomized statistical polling effort but no it's actually we want to know what this guy thinks because we want to change his mind. That's the level of structural shift that we're seeing in terms of the manipulation of people these days. Now this is still propagating. These are, these are examples that are still notable. Um, they're not going to be notable for very long though because this kind of stuff is spreading and it's spreading quickly. The, um, the most interesting of the slides that came out of the Snowden releases was um, from the UK, from GCHQ's Joint Threat Research Investigations Group. Now JTRIG um, does a bunch of work and one of the things they try and do is they're trying to figure out how they can contextualize the, um, you know, any specific thing that they intercept. So if they get a message between two people that, you know, might be somebody talking about, uh, you know, uh, Call of Duty, whatever, might be talking about a video game, or it might be talking about their plans to blow up an embassy, well, they'd like to, to understand the difference between those two. So they started trying to, to dig into f mapping the cultural context that people have conversations in, which, you know, if you accept what they're doing at all might be, might be interesting and if, assume, if you assume that they should be intercepting the conversations of random gamers, um, they could also just not do that. Um, but where it goes from there is they're like, well, okay, so if we can read cultural context, why don't we just write it too? And they're looking at that same kind of mass scale manipulation, that same kind of looking at how do we shift either the political opinions of individuals by figuring out which specific narratives and stories we need to feed to them culturally or how do we do this on an entire population scale? So is that free will? The reason why all of this stuff is happening is that the cost of surveillance has plummeted. Um, if you look at just even in the, the broadest strokes, what the cost of storing and processing a string of data has gone, you know, how that, how that change has gone from say the Second World War until now, it's a shift at least on the order of a billion times cheaper now. And it's, it's even hard to count. It's possibly more like, you know, a hundred trillion times cheaper 
It is so much cheaper now to manipulate and store data that it's actually hard to measure because we just, it's, it's hard to even conceptualize the difference between a human entering information into a whole earth tabulator and what we can do now with a, with a modern cloud storage system. Um, the reason why all of this surveillance is happening is because it's gotten so much cheaper to do. If it's free to do something and you can make money doing it, then of course someone's going to try doing it. If it's free to do something and you can plausibly make an argument for budget that will, you know, whether or not it's actually going to have a national security impact, you can convince someone to give you money to do it, of course somebody's going to try and do it. Um, if we want to change all of this, we need to among other things, change that cost. Now, the, with, with all due respect to Senator Ludlam, the, the legal arguments are very important here. Yes, we absolutely need to try and fight to maintain the legal environment which will preserve our rights to the greatest degree that we can. However, one of the interesting exceptionaries to that is foreign intelligence surveillance. Now, whether or not this argument applies to domestic is another question, but foreign intelligence surveillance has historically not been regulatable. Um, I have yet to find, certainly anywhere in the five eyes, a really notable example of law constraining collection, constraining surveillance specifically, where it was constrained by law and not by economics. Um, We've tried to do various things at some points. The big example that everyone holds up is the church commission in the US about like, yes, we totally won that. We totally, you know, forced them to, to back off on, on this. But it turns out we didn't. Um, the only things that the church commission managed to accomplish were it stopped four guys in a post office from Xeroxing the front of envelopes being sent to the Soviet Union. And it was literally four guys. Um, except they started doing that again for all mail um, about 15 years later. And it uh, convinced NSA that they should stop reading Americans' telegraphs. They were planning on doing that anyway because it was kind of pointless even in 77, like no one used the telegraph system for anything. They'd never found anything in the, in the 37 years they'd been doing it. It's just like, okay, we're, we're done, you know, whatever, fine. We'll stop reading your telegraphs. Are you happy now? We stopped surveilling you. Come on. Um, so we don't, we don't have any track record of being able to actually stop foreign intelligence surveillance. Now, foreign intelligence surveillance is actually incredibly important for privacy because it turns out that almost everything is foreign intelligence surveillance. If I need your information as an Australian and I can't get it because it's domestic here, I go to the Americans, I ask them to get your information, then I get it from them. Um, and again, that falls squarely into the category of stuff that you're very unlikely to be able to stop through law. Um, we're, we're sort of stumbling into an autocracy in this country, which is to a, to a level which is incredibly disturbing. Um, so I'm an Australian. I have never lived here. I grew up in the States. And when I was preparing for this talk, I was like, okay, it's well past time I finally came to terms with Australian politics, which I've been kind of ignoring for the past, um, you know, couple decades because every time I, I look at the news over here, I just get mildly terrified. Um, but it was time to finally actually, actually understand what's been going on here. And dear Jesus, guys, what the fucking hell is going on here? This is ridiculous. You call this a democracy? I, uh, you know, it's, it is, it is, and I say this as someone who does follow American politics and I'm, I try not to confuse what happens on the political stage with anything that might be realistically political or important. But even if you just look at the, at the structure of American governance, you know, yes, it is clearly, clearly not democratic. Um, I mean, at least we do sort of pretend that's kind of worth something. The things like the restrictions on the press that are happening here are frankly unprecedented in Western 
nations that pretend to be democracies. This is not a small issue. Um, and as far as I can tell, again, absolutely no disrespect to anyone in this room, there is no opposition. It's just sort of happening, and I am deeply confused by this. I'm not sure where that lack of opposition is coming from, because I think, I hope, and again, this may be that I'm too close to this issue, that the dangers should be incredibly clear. Um, Australia has a real deep history of a certain kind of political rebellion. You know, not, not in more recent years, but that history is there. And that history of a certain, a certain kind of, you know, I want to be left alone is there. I think that we should kind of start reinvestigating some of that history and try to find, you know, what that message is that, that wakes people up, what that message is that wakes people up across the political spectrum. And I know that there are folks in this room from, you know, both the kind of traditional liberal and, and left suspects, you know, progressive and left suspects, but there are also some folks, you know, much more from the, the right and libertarian side of the spectrum here. And I am very thankful that you guys are here because this is not a left issue. This is not a socialist issue. This is just an issue about basic human rights. This is an issue that absolutely everyone across the political spectrum should be concerned about. You know, you can, you can be a complete free market capitalist who believes in, you know, a strong security state, and you can still look at what happened in East Germany, look at what's happening in Turkey right now, or in um, Romania and Hungary. You know, a lot of, there are so many examples. If you give a surveillance state too much power, it will be used, and it will be used in all sorts of ways. We've already seen in Australia, we've seen numerous cases where these kinds of surveillance powers are, are being used to harass activists for completely unrelated reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with national security. You know, the, the notion that, no, no, we need these powers because big, bright, shiny terrorist of the week, um, I think it's been two or three terrorists this week, you know, the, the Khorasan group is, is uh, one of the latest manufactured Come on, guys. Nobody believes it anymore, right? I hope. Um, you know, this is not, th those are not where these things are being used. These things are being used against WikiLeaks. They're being used against adversaries of coercive trade negotiations. They're being used against people who think that it might be nice if we had, say, running water in Australia in 10 years. Um, the, the single constant that we see of surveillance systems, and this is true around the world and across significant chunks of history, the single constant that we see is that every single time you build a surveillance system, no matter how strong the checks that you thought you had in place on it, every single time you build a system like this, it is abused and it is thoroughly abused. So if we're gonna fight this, trying to pass laws that say, no, don't do that, you're not allowed to use this surveillance system to do anything but this narrow little thing here. I mean, we're okay with you having it, but you can only use it for this. It's bullshit, they don't work. They're completely pointless. They get abused at, at a significant scope. Now, I'm not saying that we should have zero surveillance. I'm not even saying that we, sh you know, I'm not saying that we should abolish international intelligence. We can have that conversation if you want, but that's not this conversation. Um, but if we're going to effectively restrain these organizations, the thing that we need to do is make it expensive for them to surveil again. Because both corporations and nation states will build and use surveillance systems as aggressively as they can and do as much surveillance as they can afford to do. As long as there is return on investment on that surveillance, they are going to do it. So one of the things which I've found is really interesting, and this goes back to those folks who were, um, 
who are building that early internet is that if you have an idea, if you have a really good idea about the politics that you want a technical system to contain, then that system will end up mirroring those politics. That system will end up reflecting whatever dreams you kind of build into it. Unfortunately, the dreams that most of, kind of most layers of our modern internet, because kind of when things started going wrong was like 97 and almost everything we interact with now that we consider the internet is new since then, um, even at the protocol level. The, the dreams that people were building those systems with were mostly dreams about money. They were, they were dreams about how they were gonna get rich off of this thing. And suddenly we've got an internet that reflects that, that cares a lot more about money in the protocol layers than it does about freedom. So one of the things that we need to do is we need a new set of technologies and we need those technologies built from a perspective that actually thinks about freedom. Um, that is what it looks like to make surveillance expensive again. It looks like actually thinking about this as a condition of, of building technologies, but that's not enough because we do need the legal side, we do need the policy side as well, right? We do need to actually build something that lets us campaign. Um, when I was doing the research for this, one of the things which was, which was really interesting was trying to go through and understand how the intelligence system actually works in this country, like where the oversight is. Even the oversight that we know is, is kind of pretend is maybe not actually doing anything, where is it? And I have to say again, versus the American example, the UK example, the German example, this is an incredibly opaque country. Um, as far as like who has surveillance authorities, who can approve things. You know, one of the things that I found which was, which was shocking, if you look at what um, ASIO means by warrant, when, when I'm, I'm used to, to, you know, if they issue a warrant for surveillance, like that's a thing that involves a judge, it's a somewhat adversarial process at least, not the director general of ASIO says, we need a warrant for this, scribble. Here you go. Like they can issue their own warrants. This is, this is ridiculous. You know, this is, not, this is not how we do things in a democracy. Um, where is the campaign? You know, I, I, I strongly support the work that EFA does, but EFA is not a campaigning organization right now. You know, EFA throws an amazing workshop like this um, but there is no really solid campaigning organization and this is why Scott is having to use um, you know, memes, why that's sort of the best thing that we can do is let's rally the internet and just kind of go out there and take a bunch of wild swings and hope it's good enough. And it, it may actually well be good enough. I'm not saying that, that we cannot do incredible things by just sort of coming together in a flurry and, and going out there and making things happen because it does work, but it works a lot better if you actually have sustained campaigning organizations that are kind of part and parcel of that. Um, and I don't see that yet in Australia. So what I do the rest of my time when I'm not up on stage is talking right now is I'm looking at trying to figure out how we can make the internet safe for high risk users again. And this is something which it turns out is, so there's, there's sort of, in some ways two, two kinds of users of the internet, and which is really sort of saying two kinds of people in society because the internet is really just sort of society. Um, there, are, there are people who haven't done something that annoyed someone with power and there are people who have. And there are a whole lot of folks out there who are working on how do we secure the internet for people who haven't annoyed anyone with power. Um, you know, 
people like the the Chrome security team, you know, who are who are you know trying to build a good browser that will kind of keep people safe in the default case, who probably aren't being particularly targeted. They're subject to the kind of background radiation of internet surveillance and um, organized crime and this and that, but they're probably not being super specifically targeted. And you know, then you have anybody who's kind of stuck their head above the parapet. You know, and this means activists, this means journalists, dissidents, sex workers, asylum seekers, domestic violence victims. You know, this isn't just the kind of obvious political cases, although they're obviously on that list too. And, um, you know, there is, a, there is an internet freedom community that is, is doing what it can to try and help these people, but they're, they're massively outgunned, right? Because, you know, as soon as you stick your head up, you're subject to a $600 billion global set of powers, you know, to some, to some share of the attention of that searchlight. And structurally, you know, there's, there's very little that a, that a kind of like little, I don't know, $30 million NGO scene that's kind of scrabbling around can can do against that right now. So that's one of my big questions right now is, is how we scale that up. And I have some of my own answers, but that's, that's again a, a later conversation. Um, but if we don't find an answer there, we're in trouble. Um, the internet over the past 20 years has become incredibly important to human freedom. Um, it has become incredibly important to the way we the way we function as democracies, you know, how many? And I know this is probably a somewhat a somewhat internet centric audience. How many people here get most of their news from a source other than the internet? That's like okay, five or six people. Um, if you don't have an internet that allows for free publication, you've lost that, that news. Um, if you have an internet that doesn't allow for the free production of news, you've lost all of those news sources because I can tell you I've never met a reporter in the past decade who doesn't do almost all of their work online. It's just how news works anymore, how news works now. And if we don't have a free internet, all of that is threatened. Now it's only threatened, it's only threatened really if you, if you kind of stand up, but if anybody who stands up gets cut down, then you know, the, the actual freedom that we can express really goes away. So, and, and of course this is, you know, this is not going backwards. You know, this is only going to continue. This is only going to get stronger and stronger. Um, the fact that we can have you know, a campaign that is, hey, let's all get together on the internet and make a bunch of noise and have that actually meaningfully swing politics goes away if we can't protect high-risk users, if we can't protect the people who do choose to stand up. So on the legal side, in addition to trying to get rid of the obvious kind of positive structures, so by positive structure I mean things like data retention, things like, um, you know, requirements to backdoor security systems, you know, those things that, that actively make us weaker. In addition to trying to get rid of those, there are a bunch of other things that we need to see happen. Um, obviously, you know, we need to continue to allow a free press to actually be a free press. But if you look at things like, um, uh, if you look at things like the um, network neutrality, which has been kind of one of the, one of the big bugbears of internet freedom folks for completely unrelated reasons, right? Network neutrality actually turns out to be incredibly key to the fight for a free internet to the fight for any kind of communication freedom. If we're gonna make surveillance expensive again, one of the things that that requires us to do is decentralize. It requires us to stop using these centralized services that can simply take all of our data. 
Now, that means that we need a neutral network because decentralization means that, that these things are going to suddenly be running services and we're going to be talking phone to phone or laptop to laptop much more. A non-neutral network means you can't do that. It just kills any possibility of that from the start. So even these things which seem very kind of not directly related end up being very core parts of this. So we need to go through and figure out, okay, what are all of the, where are all of the places that corporations and that the people who design these systems can be influenced? How do we, how do we work on these people? You know, how do we, how do we work on these, the, the people who are making these decisions so that they make the choices that make surveillance expensive again? And that's, you know, as much as we need to look at, um, as much as we need to look at kind of fighting the fight on these positive issues, we also need to look at making sure that we preserve space for and shape the market in the direction of making surveillance expensive again. The, this, is, this is not a fight that's, that's, we're going to win exactly. This is a fight that we're going to keep fighting forever. As long as we have a state that is constructed in the manner of the state that we have now, it is going to try and push back. It is going to try and drag us back further and further into this kind of surveillance world. This is simply a, a fact of having electronic communication. We don't, get to, we don't get to turn it off, we don't get to shut it down. We're, we're kind of stuck with this forever. Um, which is honestly one of the reasons that we need something that is more campaign-like. Because again, we can do this flurry of internet memes, but, and that may, that may get us out of, out of this breach, but you can't sustain that kind of energy over decades. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it's decades, it's centuries, right? This is, this is simply a, a matter of internet communication. However, there's also something about the moment that we're in right now. Um, not just in terms of the inertia that we have, but as we look at the kind of increasing spread of the internet into society, it is getting harder and harder to change those core protocols, right? There is more and more of society built on top of these things, built on top of the internet. Every time another phone is sold, that's another device that you have to patch and update if we're going to shift fundamental protocols. Um, and we're, we're kind of at this, at this moment where, where we're about to see a whole lot of embedded sensors get rolled out, a whole lot of embedded actuation systems, um, you know, whether it's climate control systems for buildings or, um, you know, street lighting systems, whatever, otherwise known as the Internet of Things, but really it's just a whole lot of more Internet touching a whole lot more things. Um, you know, all of that has to be part of part of any technological shift too. So while we're, in a, while we're in this for a very long fight, we also need to, we need to start winning soon. Um, you know, and that, and that means winning the technical victories as well as the legal victories. Um, there's, a, there's a RAND paper that I like to cite sometimes, um, although it's kind of weird to be citing RAND. Um, uh, R&D, not, not Ayn Rand. Um, the, uh, it's, it's called Tribes, Institutions, Markets, and Networks. Um, and it talks about each of these as being kind of fundamental forms of social organization. And I think that this is, um, this is a really useful point that the internet is not actually a technological construct. The internet is a human construct we see it as a technological construct because the technology is very new. Um, but if you think of institutions, like if you think of the Catholic Church, for instance, we don't think of the Catholic Church as being a technological institution because the technology that it's built on is writing on paper. And we don't think of that as technology anymore because we're very used to it and it's very old. But it is technology, of course it's technology. Um, similarly, we don't, you know, Okay, so maybe some of us think of banks as technological institutions 
And, you know, increasingly now, obviously, they are high-tech networked institutions. But if you think of banks in 1860, you know, well, those aren't technological institutions. All they depend on is offset printing, um, you know, fast ships for, for moving mail around internationally, um, two-column entry bookkeeping. Um, you know, of course, they're, of course they're technological institutions. But the, so the RAND paper is saying that each time we get one of these kinds of new organizing structures for society, um, it changes the meaning of all of the other ones. So when markets became a significant force, the meaning of tribes and institutions changed significantly. When, and now we're in the moment where networks are becoming a significant force. And this means that we're in the moment where the meaning of, of tribes and institutions and markets is all changing significantly. Where, where power comes from and flows to and how it moves around is changing. Um, but it's only going to be changing for so long, right? That's, that's getting baked into society at a fairly deep level. So while we're going to have to keep fighting this rear guard action for a long time, we're, you know, we also can lose you know, and we can put ourselves in a position where we will be desperately trying to scrape our way out of a heavily surveilled society um, for, for generations and generations. Um, and it turns out that right now losing is very easy. All we have to do is not do anything um, because we've lost catastrophically. Um, now, we can win this. Of course we can win this. But it's going to mean real work. It's going to mean real organization. It's going to mean coming together and building things that are much larger than, us, than ourselves, both technologically and organizationally. And I think where I'd like to leave you today is with a call this time next year. Let's come back into this room with a serious Australian rights campaigning organization in existence something that can actually deliver meaningful pressure in an institutional long-term context, serious meaningful pressure for change and for fundamental rights.